And we're not quite. All right, now we're on air. Start now. Welcome, everyone. I'm Karen Duderstadt. I will be the moderator for this session today. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, and I am a clinical professor here in San Francisco at University of California, San Francisco. I want to thank you all for joining the webinar today. It's very nice to have all of you on. We appreciate your participation. And this is the third webinar in this series that is sponsored by the maternal, by, sponsored by the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. We call it ANI. And the webinar, as you know, is focused on maternal child environmental health. We have two excellent speakers today, and they're ready to go. So I'm going to give you an introduction for the first speaker, Dr. Dr. Abby Alcon. And then after Dr. Alcon's presentation, I'll be introducing the second speaker. We will certainly be taking um, questions today. And if you could notice the chat um, in the upper uh, part of your window uh, where it says um, live chat, if you have any questions or anything you want to bring up during the presentations, please put them in there. We will be monitoring that. And then both Dr. Alcon uh, and um, Dr. Barbara Sattler will be answering questions. We'll leave some time at the end of the webinar. So let me start with Dr. Abby Alcon. She's a professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing and a research investigator at the University of California, Berkeley Center for Environmental Research and Children's Health. She is also director of the California Child Care Health Program uh, at UCSF here in San Francisco. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner and epidemiologist for over 20 years, and she has um, clinical research experience in the fields of pediatrics, public health, and in epidemiology. Her research focuses on the social and physical environment and its effects on children's health and development. Dr. Alcon has conducted many studies on health and safety in child care environments and how child care health professionals can intervene to improve the overall quality of child care programs. And she will be talking about some of these studies uh, today in her presentation. She did lead an interdisciplinary team in the development of a toolkit, which is the Integrated Pest Management Toolkit, and it's focused on early care and education programs and has been implemented in the California child care programs. Today, she will be presenting on pesticide exposure in children, and she will be sharing some of her research, as I mentioned, on the impact of pesticide exposure on child health. And she will be available again, as I mentioned, for questions at the end of the webinar. Please do submit your questions in the chat uh, and let us know if you have any questions during the webinar. Thank you all, and um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Alcon. Thank you, Karen. So as Karen said, I'm gonna be talking about pesticide exposures in children. Next slide. Um, the overview of my talk is that I'll talk about pesticide exposure in children's health to give you some background. I'll talk about a study that I'm involved in right now that is funded by, by NIEHS and give you some preliminary findings because it's been really exciting. And talk about uh, key messages and children's environmental health policy to end with some ways to continue to be active and to stay up to date about environmental health. Next slide. So when we talk about pesticides, we really have to define what it is. So what is a pesticide? It's a substance or mixture of substances intended to prevent, destroy, repel, or mitigate any pest. So there are a lot of different examples of pesticides, and you might have used some yourself. So some of them being a roach or an ant spray, flea bombs, rat poison, wheat kills, mothballs, insecticide chalk, being some of them being legal, some not legal, and also disinfectants are actually considered pesticides. And we talk a lot about disinfectants now about COVID. Um, and some of the pesticides contain baits and gels. And these are just some of the examples that I'm gonna be talking about the different chemicals that are in these pesticides and what we want to be aware of and what to mitigate. Next slide. So why are we concerned about pesticide use? It's really about health, and that's what's so wonderful about presenting to you. We all are worried about children's health, and this is the main concern that we have in the work that we do. We know that the health outcomes related to pesticides, some of them are short-term and quick and acute, and some of them are long-term. Ones that we've studied have been about skin rashes and breathing problems. The long-term problems are things like chronic conditions like asthma, cancer, damage to the brain and nervous system, immune system damage, and endocrine disruption. In terms of the vulnerable populations that we're worried about, we think about children, pregnant women, elderly, and people with breathing or lung disorders. 
next. And when we're considered, uh, we're thinking about the damage that um, the pesticides do to the environment, we're concerned about our water um, and the contamination in the air and the environment. So things that we talk about is the quality of our water, and this is an area that we're concerned about today. Also pesticide resistance. We know that when pesticides are being used, the pests become resistant. And what happens over time is that the industries develop more concentrated and different kinds of pesticides, and that could also cause more harm. Next slide. So why are children more vulnerable? Um, then their exposure is different than adults. Because the children have frequent contact with the ground or the floor where pesticides collect, they're more likely to be exposed to the pesticides. Of course, because of their hand-to-mouth activity that developmentally is a normal thing, could be more of a concern if there's pesticides on the ground. They also eat, drink, and breathe more per pound than adults. They spend more time indoors, and there's been studies to show that actually children spend more time indoors than outdoors is actually um, kind of a sad idea, but that's what's been happening because children are in schools, in childcare, and also in our homes. So we want to make sure that those environments are safe. We're concerned about their development. So we know that children have their brain and organ development, their nervous system development, and that's why they're more vulnerable if they're exposed to chemicals at this age. So what are the pathways of exposure for children? Um, sort of what we've been talking about is by eating different kinds of foods, they could get, uh, chemicals can get into their body, mostly by breathing, um, really that they um, are have a faster respiratory rate than adults, so they get a lot more air, and if the pesticides are in the air, that will get into their developing lungs. Through their skin, which happens to be the largest organ and the largest surface area. And also across the placenta, there's been several studies showing that the prenatal effects of exposure to chemicals can affect the children um, as newborns and after they develop. Next slide. So where are pesticides found? Really everywhere. They're so common in our everyday life. And in California, we have a lot of pesticides in our agriculture and other states do too. And we have crop dusters that you can actually see um, that are spreading pesticides into the air. The fruits and vegetables that we eat, if they're not organic, um, have pesticides. The household products that we use to clean. Um, the houses, the buildings themselves could have um, pesticides in the products that they use and also in the ground seeping through like radon. The contaminated water, we're concerned about lead and other things like pesticides in the water. And we know that in our homes and in childcare and in schools, there are concerns about exposure to pesticides. Next slide. So what is integrated pest management? It's really Interesting because I feel like we've talked so much about the negative effects of pesticides, but now we have some alternatives and different ways to think about approaching pesticides to mitigate the risk. And it's called integrated pest management. It's really an approach to managing pests that focuses on prevention, monitoring, reducing harm, and minimizing health risk. Next slide. So we've developed this integrated pest management um, curriculum. And in the curriculum, we highlight the cycle of IPM and really how IPM works to reduce the exposure to pesticides. We start with prevention, where you keep pests out, you remove the pest food and water and shelter. The next level is inspection. Look for the signs of pests, evidence and damage, and look for the pests themselves. Identify what pests are there. Monitor the um, pests that are there, and if you can, reduce the numbers, and you can keep track of that. And then manage things on a daily basis by cleaning thoroughly, vacuuming, using traps, and if you need to, use baits and gels, but do not use sprays. Next slide. So when we talk about prevention and keeping pests out, you can see that there are different ways that pests can come into a home, a childcare center, which is where these pictures or the graphics are from. Um, so what we wanna do is think about, you. next click. We want to seal or block gaps around the doors and in install door sweeps. Next click. We want to seal the gaps around any pipes to get rid of the leaks. Next click. 
patch holes and screens. And our take home message here is to clo close off any entryways so pests can't get into your facility in the first place. Next slide is on prevention. So the way we wanna look at prevention is to remove pest food and water. We wanna clean up the food before the pests are attracted to leftovers, eliminate sanitation and garbage problems, eliminate standing water, clogged sinks and leaking faucets, and store the food and art supplies in sealed containers. So our take home message here is that pests need food and water to survive. So take away their access to these things and you're taking away their diet. Next slide is on inspection. And what I've developed with my team is an integrated pest management checklist. And in this checklist, we've developed objective ways of just walking through a childcare facility to see if they are practicing IPM practices and to identify the gaps in their practice to help with interventions. So what we look for is pest. We also look for the signs of pest and their damage and conditions that might attract the pest. This checklist is free and available on our website. The next step is management. So often you can manage pests without using any chemicals, and we recommend different techniques. So here you can see prevention is to clean up the tables. Vacuuming is really important in terms of removing pests, washing areas with soap and water, and placing traps so that we can find out where the animals are and monitor. Our take home message here is keep things clean and in good repair is the key to IPM. The last step is management. So if you have to select a, a pesticide, we really want you to think about not using sprays. And that's the basic message. No sprays and foggers, but on the left-hand side, the baits and the gels and traps are okay. So if you have to use a pesticide as a last resort, then you should use the least harmful application method, which are baits, gels, and traps. So just to give you a little background to the study that I've been involved in, it's called the Healthy Children and Environment Study. And I have a nice team of people from the California Child Care Health Program, from UCSF Department of Epidemiology, and at UC Berkeley, I have colleagues in environmental health. The study goal is to reduce preschool children's exposure to pesticides in child care centers to improve their long-term health. It's a randomized control study with a detention control design. And what that means is that we have one group who gets the intervention of integrated pest management and the other group gets physical activity. Next slide. Next slide. So in the end, after five years, we plan to have 88 child care centers and 40, 440 children. Um, right now, I have to say because of COVID, the study is on hiatus, but we have collected data over three years and we're planning once COVID is under control to come back and to finalize the next two years. So we have four California counties that are involved in the study. They're matched and randomly assigned to either the intervention, which is integrated pest management or physical activity. Next slide. The nurses in our study are trained to be child care health consultants. And we have a model in which the intervention here can show you how we look at providing assessment, the intervention and outcome. So the first thing we do is develop an, a workshop. We provide in-person or online workshops on integrated pest management. The next is we go out and do assessment and management, uh, which is click for the next one, which is we do our checklist to provide an assessment of the environment. Next is we do our consultation services, which we do monthly. The next one is the first level of change that we look for are policies that change in the child care center. The next level, click, is the practices. So we're looking to observe changes in health practices. And the highest level of change is the last click, which is children's health. So what we're looking for is we're having child care health consultants come out and do the intervention. And this IPM toolkit is the one that we've developed, and it was funded by a grant from the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. And we have one also for family child care homes. And it has a lot of different materials. We have a curriculum, we have complementary materials, being health and safety notes, fact sheets, posters, our checklists, um, and slides so people can go out and do this presentation. And um, we use this in our workshop and we give one to every um, center that's in our study. Next slide. 
We also give out these toolkits for physical activity. So we have a very parallel structure to the study where those who get integrated pest management have a nurses doing that intervention. And then the other group has nurses doing a physical activity workshop and intervention. Next slide. We also give out toolboxes to show exactly how you can implement the IPM or physical activity right away. So we give the materials that they can use immediately. Next slide. The novel part of this study is that we are actually trying to measure the actual pesticide level that's being exposed to the children and the childcare staff in the center and also at an individual level. At the center level, we actually collect dust. This is a very strange looking vacuum, but this is how we collect our dust and we, um, package it up, put it in our freezer, and then we have it analyzed for different pesticides. Next slide. For individual levels of pesticides, we're able to do silicon wristbands, and we put these wristbands on the children, and we also have some for the childcare providers. And we make sure that they wear them for at least 30 hours um, because they collect the pesticides that are in the air. It gets absorbed into the wristband and is analyzed in Oregon State University by Dr. Anderson's lab to tell us what pesticides the children and the child care providers have been exposed to. Next slide. This is a list of our 18 pesticides that we monitor in the dust and the wristbands. And the majority of them are pyrethroids, as you can see on the right hand side. A few of them are organophosphates and a few others. Mostly they are indoor pesticides and a few are agricultural. Next slide. Just to share our preliminary results, you can move on to the next slide for the director characteristics. So right now we have 32 centers in our study. The majority of the directors are female, have a varied degree, and 41% are Latino, and most of them are quite experienced with 25 years. Next slide. In terms of the families, we have about 41% are Latino a lot of low income families. But what's interesting here are the environmental health practices just to learn what is happening in people's homes. About 35% use exterminators. A lot of them have carpeting. Um, they are not that, not many, many of them are cleaning every single day. Um, some people have mold in their homes. Some people live near agricultural fields. So these are risk factors for higher levels of pesticides. Next slide. In terms of the program characteristics, we're also interested in do they hire somebody to do um, spray pesticides? Um, how often do they deep clean their carpets? Are they using a HEPA filter? Do they have doormats? And we actually do an observation of the products that are in the child care centers, and we find these are the products that we, we see um, on the shelf. Next slide. When we look at our outcomes, we first looked at our workshops to see, well, was there an increase in knowledge? And there was a significant increase in knowledge. And it, just as an example, we asked them which pesticide poses the least health risk to people, the answer being bait stations, and there was a significant increase in knowledge. Next slide. After knowledge, we look at practices. And here we can see from the director interview that we had an increase in many different areas of knowledge about what is IPM, do you work with a pest management company? And we're trying to have them reduce the amount of sprays that they use, but to use um, baits and gels. And we had um, some really positive changes in these areas. Next slide. From the IPM checklist that we do, we also found a significant increase in practices. It was over 10% and that was statistically significant. Next slide. And the next slide after that, we'll show you the results of our dust. So this is the dust that we collected in the centers at baseline and post intervention. And we found that there were six pesticides that were quite common. And it really says that in almost all of our dust samples, there was almost 100% of the dust samples that were monitored had pesticides in it. And it really shows that pesticides are quite common in the dust. Next slide. And here we can see what the same pesticides are in the wristbands. And what we do see is that there has been some decrease in the amount of bifenthrin and fipronol from baseline to post intervention as measured in our wristbands. But it also shows that these are 
not that uncommon in terms of the exposures that the children are having in the child care center um, based on the wristband analysis that we have. Next slide. So of the most frequently detected pesticides, we just were interested in looking into this a little further. Like, why are these the pesticides that were commonly found? And we weren't really sure at first. So we looked at really what is happening. And these are mostly pyrethroid insecticides. And they might be used in ant and roach sprays. Um, some of them are used actually on pets. And it might be that, that people are um, using these products on their pets and getting exposed that way. Chlorpyrifos, we know, is a pesticide that was used in agriculture in California. It's no longer used in agriculture, um, but it has been one that's been quite common because it is sitting in the dust and gets into the carpet. Bifenthrin is also used commonly in California, so we've been seeing a lot of that. Next slide. So to summarize our findings from our study in just after our two years, we found that the IPM intervention is effective in changing knowledge, self-efficacy, and practices. But we also did find that the preschool age children and staff are being exposed to pesticides in the child care centers. The children in the IPM centers did show a reduction in bifenthrin um, after the intervention but not the other pesticides. And we didn't find any significant decrease in pesticides detected in the dust or wristbands um, overall in the intervention centers compared to the control centers. Next slide. So what are some of our key messages? So the next slide. What we found was when we were going out to talk to child care centers and to the directors and the community, um, what did we want to have as our take home messages? We want to say some of the common things that we think about in terms of reducing risk and exposure to pesticides, wash hands, have good ventilation, have a clean environment, separate the outside from the indoor by using wiping your shoes and having mats, no shoe policy is the best, don't use any sprays, and have a healthy diet. Next slide. So what do we do in terms of advocacy and health organizations that, and, um, and policy? We want to think about children's environmental health. And as you know, your organization, the ANHE, is excellent. The American Academy of Pediatrics has some great technical and policy reports. And in 2012, they had one specific to pesticide exposure. The American Public Health Association has two new policy statements this year on environmental health in children. Um, NIEHS has some really wonderful funding for centers on environmental health, and I'll share with you on some things right after this. EPA has important information about registering um, pesticides so we can know what are safer pesticides. The CDC has guidelines. The Children's Environmental Health Network has a blueprint for protecting children's environmental health. The Healthy Schools Network has some great resources. And I'm a part of a new National Center of Health and Behavioral Health and Safety um, funded through the Office of Head Start. And we're going to have a new focus on environmental health. Next slide. So what are recommendations for policy reform? Um, this was a um, article that was published in PLOS Medicine in 2018. And it really summarizes, I think, where we need to go and what we need to be thinking about. We have to have a government phase out of chlorpyrifos and other organophosphate pesticides. We need to monitor our watersheds and other sources of human exposure. We need to promote the use of integrated pest management. We need to have mandatory surveillance of pesticide-related illnesses. We need curriculum on the hazards of OP pesticides, and it needs to be in nursing and medical schools. We need to educate patients and public about the hazards. And if we can, accelerate the development of non-toxic approaches to pest control through IPM. Next slide. I'm just going to mention one act that happened in California. We have a Healthy Schools Act. And I'm not going to go through the details, but just to say it has actually been really positive to um, help the people who work in schools and child care to reduce the amount of spraying and pesticides because now there is a law that says that they have to take a course, they have to post things before they spray, and it's really to uh, make an incentive for them not to use pesticides and to learn more about integrated pest management. 
Next slide. And in California in 2018, we also have a new regulation um, that is for the growers and the people who are spraying that they can no longer spray within a quarter of a mile of a school or a childcare center during daytime hours. And so these are some small inroads, but little bits of uh, policy and regulation that can hopefully reduce the exposure to pesticides. So thank you for your time and I'll be monitoring the chat and look forward to the Q&A at the end of Barbara's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alcon. Uh, this is Karen Duderstadt, again, the, mo the moderator for today. Just an excellent presentation and so much information. Um, we did have a question about the uh, toolkit and we certainly will be sending that out after the, the uh, presentation, but also you might notice that it was uh, posted in the chat for those of you who were able to link to it uh, during the presentation. Uh, and also just lots of um, looking forward to the final results of your study because you, the preliminary results are also very informative for nurses. So our second speaker today is Dr. Barbara Sattler. Uh, Dr. Barbara Sattler is a professor at the University of San Francisco. She's an international leader in environmental health and nursing. She's a founding and very active member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, who is sponsoring the webinar today. Uh, at the University of San Francisco, she teaches currently the environmental health in the Doctorate of Nursing Practice program and also the Master's of Public Health program. Prior to her position at the University of San Francisco, Dr. Sattler was at the University of Maryland for 25 years, where she directed the Environmental Health Education Center in the School of Nursing at the University of Maryland. Over the years, Dr. Sattler has led projects on lead poisoning prevention, greening hospitals, sustainable agriculture, climate change, children's environmental health, and faculty development programs in environmental health. She's been an advisor to the US EPA's Office of Child Health Protection and the National Library of Medicine for informational needs of health professionals on environmental health. Uh, Dr. Sattler is also the PI on a host of grants, including those um, for the EPA and uh, the Housing and Urban Development, and also the NIEHS, which Dr. Um, Alcon mentioned. She helped to found Healthcare Without Harm, a national organization focused on greening the healthcare sector. She's the author of Environmental Health and Nursing and many peer-reviewed articles. She is an RN with a doctorate in public health from John Hopkins School of Nursing, uh, I'm sorry, School of Public Health, and she will be presenting today on fossil fuels, uh, fracking, and the impact on child health. So, uh, Dr. Sattler, go right ahead. I think you're on mute, Dr. Sattler. Yes, I was on mute and I couldn't find my name. So, <laughs> Thank you so very much for that introduction. And I am delighted to be here. And Abby, that was a fabulous talk. I took lots of notes and I have lots of questions for you. So I'll try and uh, go quickly so everybody will have a chance to ask their questions. Next slide, please. I'd like to just start quickly by showing over, over the literally centuries how we've made a lot of changes in our sources of energy starting uh, almost entirely on wood, and then really moving into coal as a substantial uh, portion of our energy sources. This is in the United States. And how that then began to be uh, lessened as other sources came into play. And I'd like you to see, particularly as we get into the last three bars there, that coal, is, which is the dirtiest source of fossil fuels, is now really decreasing, and um, and we're beginning to see um, natural gas, uh, which is sourced from fracking, uh, take its place. Next, please. In terms of uh, looking at the total uh, amount that's being used, when I first started giving talks about fracking, coal was about 20%, natural gas was about 20%, and renewables was around 5%. So if, if you look at those numbers, our pie is significantly changing and has within the last 10 years, less coal, more natural gas, and wonderfully, more renewables. Next, please. So I'm specifically going to be talking uh, about fracking uh, today. Um, there are lots of things uh, about uh, other sources of fossil fuels uh, that would require whole other talks. But I do want people to know that you can't just frack everywhere. You have to frack where there are certain kinds of rocks, 
called shale. And um, that's where the natural gas deposits are. And this map shows you in the United States where we have these shale deposits. Next, please. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to make you all uh, in, in, energy engineers by the end of this, but simply to say that the basics of fracking is that we drill a well. And in some instances, though not in California, but in many other places around the country, we drill it straight down and then we're able to go horizontally. We then uh, push down that well, um, chemicals, propellants, explosives, a large amount of water under pressure. And what happens is that it goes into the shale, breaks it open, keeps it open by small amounts of sand and silica. And then because there's so much pressure there, it flows back. And that flow back uh, is collected. They take the gas and or oil out, take the waste water, sometimes called flowback water, and, uh, and then they will redo that fracking. They can do that about 10 times in any given uh, frack drill site. And then, of course, the gas or oil is taken off site because that's the product they want. And then they have to deal with this produced water, which I'll talk about. Next, please. This is an actual frack site. So this is um, what it might look like from, um, a, you know, from any neighborhood where they are doing fracking. Next, please. And um, these are conventional sites. So in California, and we're between the fourth and the fifth largest oil producing state, um, about 20% of California is drilled unconventionally, meaning fracking or some other unconventional uh, methods. And we, we drill for oil in California. Even our fracking is for oil, not for um, natural gas. Whereas in Texas and Dakota, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Ohio, et cetera, they're drilling for natural gas. Next, please. But the processes are very similar and the chemicals that are in use are almost identical. And so what we do know is when people, particularly children, live in close proximity to frac sites, some of the common acute effects that are seen are headaches, nausea and vomiting, nosebleeds, kind of flu-like symptoms. People have a feeling of malaise. Um, next, please. This was a study that was done by a toxicologist, uh, Theo Culburn, who um, particularly was interested in endocrine disrupting chemicals, but she took 353 of the commonly used chemicals um, that were used in fracking and did extensive literature review, toxicological review. And what she found is of those chemicals, and these are chemicals that are used by the ton, this is not a minute amount of these chemicals. That's, you can read the slides here, 75% um, showed that they were um, had the potential to be ski, skin, eye, or respiratory irritants or cause GI problems. 40 to 50% were neurotoxicants, immunotoxicants, created some risks for cardiovascular kidney problems. 37% um, had the potential to be endocrine disrupting. And what is particularly important about endocrine disrupting chemicals is they often act differently and they're their um, exposure to disease dose response curve is different. Usually a chemical, your symptoms get worse as you increase the dose. But with endocrine disrupting chemicals, sometimes at very low doses, you see an effect. And then again, at the medium doses, not so much. And then again, at the higher low doses. So this U-shaped curve for some endocrine disrupting chemicals is unusual, but the take home message is they can be dangerous at extremely low levels. And then 25% of the chemicals were either carcinogenic or mutagenic risks. The other thing to note about many of these chemicals is they, they are persistent. 
they are chemically bound in such a tight way that they do not decompose into something safer. They stay intact in our air, water, food, and when they get in our bodies, they stay intact there. Next, please. We also have seen several studies, including a relatively recent study this year in California, um, looking at risks in associated to proximity to um, frac sites. And many other studies have been done looking at proximity to frac sites. But this one, which was uh, done by a UC Berkeley um, um, scientist, um, looked at women who were pregnant who were within a radius of 3,330 feet or outside of that radius from a frac site. And what she found was that babies who were born to moms who live within that radius had a risk of being born low birth weight and, and or premature. And as nurses, which I think is most of us on this call, we know that that creates a whole host of risks then for the baby, including potentially a stay in a NICU, having to be on oxygen because their lungs are immature, um, possibly a respirator, and a, a whole host of things that can happen then. But what I want you to see here is that that study looked at 3,330 feet. That'll be important later in my talk. Next, please. We also had a study that looked at a mile and a half distance from frac sites and found that um, babies who were born to moms within a mile and a half had a risk of a reduced APGAR score. And as nurses, we know that the APGAR score is given to a baby immediately um, after birth and then a few minutes later. And it um, all of these things, their appearance, pulse, grimace, response, activity, and muscle tone and respiration should be within normal limits. Um, they're given a score of 10, and um, and often a baby will get eight or so immediately when they're born and perk up to 10 a couple of minutes later. But what this study showed is that um, babies born to women who lived within a mile and a half had a persistent and significantly, statistically significantly lower APGAR score. Next, please. We also know, and I'm, I don't have the time to cite all of the various studies, but we know that um, uh, children and adults have an increased risk of having a diagnosis of asthma if they live in close proximity to a frac site. And also those who have the diagnosis then have a higher risk of having asthma episodes. In terms of uh, cancers, lymphoma, childhood leukemias, and um, and most recently a study in uh, Ewing sarcoma um, show that there is a relationship there. Now these cancers, <clears throat> some of them uh, uh, have a very low incidence rate, but but there's an in, nevertheless an increased risk if you are living closer to a frac site. And in Pennsylvania, a study showed increased uh, hospitalization for cardiac problems, and it appears that they were often um, cardiac arrhythmia problems as opposed to vascular problems. Next, please. The other thing that we need to know is in that wastewater, in that flowback water, because um, safely contained deep in the earth are radioactive materials like radon, thorium, radion, radium, and uranium, these are brought up. And so these then can be brought up, the workers can be exposed to them, as well as them winding up in the, in the water. And you'll see later why that's of particular interest. Um, and these create uh, potential risks for lung cancer and other cancers. Next, please. So I'm going to describe what happens to the produced water in the Central Valley in California where we're fracking. And remember again, um, this can have hundreds of potentially toxic chemicals and radioactive materials. And the reason I, I'm showing this is because I actually was there tracking this and photographing it. So this is um, not me relying on secondary sources. So next, please. In many other states, they require that holding ponds for this frac fluid be lined. 
And um, that would make sense, right? You wouldn't want it leaching into the ground and the groundwater. Next, please. This is a photograph that I took of the holding pond. It's unlined. And you can see, as you look at the fumes, these are volatilizing chemicals. So these are some of these chemicals that I described that will become gases at room temperature. So here they are becoming part of the ambient air in the community um, that is sometimes near a school, near a residential property. And this, uh, this also then, as I said, is in an unlined holding pond, having the potential to leach into the groundwater. And what we've seen in parts of the country is this groundwater is sometimes commingled with groundwater that is used for drinking water. So you can see how that might be a problem. The other thing in the Central Valley in California, which is also our agricultural uh, area, is that um, this water is sold by Chevron, who is the oil company, to the uh, farmers for them to use in irrigation. And to some of you may be thinking you didn't hear that correctly, but I'm going to say it again. They sell it to farmers to use for irrigation. Next, please. So we followed, um, we followed the water to see where it was going. And um, Scott Smith was here testing. Uh, this is a water canal because they move water around for irrigation and found uh, clear evidence of the fracking chemicals in this water. Next, please. The other thing that I've taken photos of are um, this frack water then gets used on our food crop fields. So um, I've taken pictures of it um, being used in table grapes um, and also uh, in pistachios. The other ones here, I didn't actually um, see the crops, be, but, but I know because others have measured it that the halo crops are having this mixed fracking water in their irrigation, and the cuties, carrots, um, and uh, one other crop that I can't remember right this second. But these are sold all over the country. And these are really, uh, particularly the grapes, halos, and cuties are things that we give our children all the time and thinking that we're giving them um, something good and nutritious. Um, I wanted to show the postcard on the top right because that was a postcard actually uh, sort of celebrating California for having oil and fruit orchards. And in fact, indeed, that's what we have right now. Next, please. So this is a fruit or orchard in the, in the um, distance. There's the grape vineyard. And then there's a frack site in the middle. And then what you see in the very front part of this, of this photograph is a well that's a drinking water well, all in one site. My question is why should a table grape vineyard, a water well and a frack site not ever be in the same frame? Next, please. And this is because of failed, very failed um, regulations. This poor person who owned this beautiful home in Pennsylvania had no control over how the property across the street was being used. And they uh, put a frack site in and a holding pond. So notwithstanding the huge, and you can see a flare happening there where methane is and other gases are being flared 24 seven. And notwithstanding the health effects here, consider the property value, consider the anxiety of living across the street from something like that. Next, please. And consider whether insurance is gonna cover that homeowner in the future. Um, one other thing I wanna mention very briefly is that when we, when we extract gas and oil, but particularly gas all over the country right now, um, we move it around by pipelines. And what has to happen along the way are compressor stations to move that along. And this is a sign outside of a compressor station, but I want you to look at hydrogen sulfide. This is a highly toxic chemical. Next slide. And so on site in the area, um, the workers are told when they hear the alarm for hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, um, the alert going off, they're to run to this breathing apparatus station and grab out a temporary five-minute evacuation little self-contained breathing apparatus that they can use and get the heck out of there. 
but they don't do any training to the communities that are in the surrounding areas to these compressor sites. And these compressor sites are all over the country where they're moving gas and oil. Next, please. Another thing just to note that came out during uh, COVID is a direct relationship between people who live in communities where um, they have high pollution levels from fine particulate, that, that those people actually have an increased risk of death and um, when they get a diagnosis of COVID. And so people living in the areas where they are fracking, where they are doing extraction, where they're doing refineries, these are the communities that are at an increased risk. Next, please. Um, this shows the air quality in Central uh, California and LA, which is where our oil and gas extraction is, um, is happening. Um, this is also happening at the same time that we have horrendous traffic, although not as much under COVID and also our agricultural areas where we are doing unsustainable uh, monoculture where we require them to till before ever, every planting, which gets all kinds of soil and particulate matter in the air. And all of this is happening in the same communities with the fracking and other extraction. Next, please. This is a photograph that I took when I was leaving Texas um, after visiting the Eagle Ford um, shale play there, which is a part of Texas where um, they are fracking for natural gas. Um, and, and you can see, and it actually for any of you, when you do fly again and fly over Ohio or Colorado or many of the central states um, or California now, um, but you'll see sites like this, and I want you to know that that's what you're looking at. You are looking at a, a whole swath of area that is being fracked. Um, at this point, it's probably over 15 million because this was a, an old statistic, uh, several years old, uh, lived within a mile and a half of a frack site. So remember those studies that I showed about increased risks were at um, 3, 000, over 3,000 feet and also over a mile and a half. Next, please. That's just another slide taken at lower altitude. Next, please. Um, we also know that over 2 million children live within a half mile of a gas and oil extraction site right now in the United States. Next, please. There are no federal regulations that are covering gas and oil extraction right now. When Dick Cheney had the ear of the president, um, he, had, he was also very involved in the company Halliburton, which does gas and oil um, uh, drilling and uh, refining. And he was able to uh, make sure that the gas and oil industry was not going to be regulated by the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act that regulate all other industries in the country. And so we have an industry run amok, essentially. And in, and in a couple of places around the country, they are now developing local and state regulations that require setbacks. Um, in California, we have no setback requirements. So you can have a drill site literally abutting a, a daycare center. You can have a drill site abutting a hospital and even more importantly, abutting a person's home in California. Next, please. This is a photograph that I took at a nursery school and grammar school combined um, in Central Valley. And um, this is the middle of summer when those trees should look robust and green. This was their playground where they played during the day. Then there was this little no man's land and then those dead trees. And what's on exactly the opposite side of those trees was a Chevron gas and oil field. And so this was telling to me, and I was talking to the principal as we were doing this tour. And I said, didn't it concern you that all those trees were dying over there? And she said, you know, I never noticed that. And um, there's... People who live in the areas where this is going on, her husband actually worked for Halliburton. It's part of their environment and also their communities benefit from these companies in many ways. It increases their tax base. Um, they often do 
all kinds of good little things for the communities. Next, please. But that's why we have to be raising these policies and these activities um, in a way that really is health-based. And uh, for climate change, if nothing else, we have to stop drilling. We need this to improve our air, air standards. We need this to accelerate our pathway to a, a getting away from our fossil fuel reliance, which is the biggest creator of greenhouse gas edge, gases in terms of its contribution to climate change. Next, please. There we go. Um, in Los Angeles and in Kern County, where in California, we have a lot of activity to try and really uh, address the setback issues. There's a coalition called Stand LA that is, um, this is some of their materials and their statistics on the right. They are calling for a requirement for a 2,500 foot setback, which I think is really very, very modest. At this point, I think we should be um, demanding more, but that's um, one of the things that they're asking for. Next, please. And so this is a picture uh, in Kern County where um, in some places you can look all the way to the horizon and see nothing but, but oil fields essentially. Next, please. And Kern's one of the biggest counties in California. What is being proposed by an ordinance literally right now is that they want to, um, they want to issue 70,000 new drilling permits in Kern County. And they want to do this by declaring pretty much all of Kern County one site so they can issue one big permit. As you can imagine, the community members um, and those of us who are, are in statewide organizations for public health and nursing are joining together to really um, help the Kern County, uh, County politicians right now to understand that this is going in exactly the wrong way. And, um, and we're trying also to get our governor to weigh in a bit on this. But honestly, um, this is going to be an uphill battle. Gas and oil have a huge influence in our state and in most states where um, Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, the states I've mentioned before, gas and oil has huge, huge lobbying power, almost infinite pockets to do that. And, and we as nurses, public health people, and the communities most impacted do not have infinite, not only resources, but time and resources. And uh, the group at the bottom there was a group that helped to tour a group of us as nurses. Um, these were the community members um, and some community-based organizations that helped us to better understand this. Um, and that was when I took some of the photographs. Next, please. <clears throat> so um, I'd like us to think about where we are right now. Right now in COVID, we, we know that gas prices are down. I don't, not that nobody's flying, but Far less are flying. Uh, we're watching airline industry go belly up in some instances. Fewer are certainly driving as we're all zooming away. Um, the whole demand is down. We have oil tankers off of California that are full of oil that they don't know what to do with. And our some refineries are actually refusing to take more crude. So the question is, are we are we as as taxpayers going to bail this industry out? Or are we going to say it's time for us to transition um, very intentionally now? And this is a public health, a public health decision for us. Next, please. So as nurses, we can take some leadership in this. Uh, Karen Duderstadt, who is sort of emceeing the program today, is representing Annie. Uh, with a group of people that is looking at divestment by health insurance companies from gas and oil industry as a way of giving them an economic signal that that is not where we want them putting their investments. When we think about a just transition, we need to think about those who are currently working in the industries, the refineries, the, the um, extraction sites, the drill sites, et cetera. 
Um, and, and think about how can we secure their income while they make the transition and ensure that there's job training and jobs for them to go to. And also another thing is, how do we continue to support the local taxes in those areas so they don't have reduced pu public services as they transition away from gas and oil and move towards other economic development, perhaps renewable energy uh, resources? So we know what can happen to workers and communities when we don't have a plan for the transition. We have watched what's happened in coal country, that poverty cascade has a cascade of effects. We see clinical depression, domestic violence, alcohol and substance abuse goes up, whole communities implode. Um, and we should be part of the conversation as nurses about how to do a just and healthy transition because the transition is going to happen and, and we can watch it happen and communities implode or we can have a voice in the policies to ensure that we do this in a way that's equitable, safe and healthy. Next, please. So we need a new narrative um, uh, so that workers are not seeing their jobs at stake, um, but rather that their jobs may be in a transition to something equal and better. Um, that we can have healthy and safe jobs and a healthy community and healthy environment. Um, and I think that shifting from this extractive economy right now to a caring economy, this is a narrative that nurses can embrace and can support in the policy arena. Next, please. And with that, I, I think we still have a couple of minutes for questions. I know you had some questions for Abby. And I so appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about this. And I hope that even those of you who are not in California, you can see the importance of us having a safe and healthy transition off of fossil fuels. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sattler. Just an excellent presentation with so much information and, and so many of your hands-on experiences. Um, I'm sure that the attendees learned as much as I did during this hour. We do have just a few minutes left for questions. and. What I was seeing in the chat um, was related to uh, Dr. Alcon's research. And Dr. Alcon, um, did you answer those individuals directly or did you put it in the chat? Because then all attendees may be able to see your answer. The first question that I noted was the one in relation to, um, is your research tied to research in other states? And I know you mentioned Oregon, uh, that was one of your labs, but um, I did. could you just answer that question again for the group? Please? Sure. I did answer the chat, but I'm sorry I did it to the individuals. So, um, But just to say we are not connected to any other state right now, and I do put out a call to anybody um, here. If you know of any research that's going on in your state that's related to this, I would love to have more colleagues in this field and to hear what's going on. But the National Institute of Environmental Health Sci Sciences, who's funding us, is funding us as an individual project. Um, I'm part of a larger center at UC Berkeley, um, but that's a completely different study. So um, at this point, just to say that the IPM study that I talked about is just um, an individual study. Thank you. Another and question that came up in the chat, just to mention as a, a, a comment, was they asked about if there's any problems with recruitment. And I think that's an interesting question, just because at first I thought, how are we going to go out and get people to sign up for a study where we're putting on wristbands and looking at dust and going to you know, possibly find things that are disturbing? And it actually, there wasn't any problem. People were fascinated and wanted to know more. And then when we found that there were pesticides in the dust, Again, I was worried, well, how are people going to take that? And then all they really wanted to know is, what's the take-home message? What can I do to reduce the number of pesticides? So that's what we came up with, that, that slide that I shared with you. Um, but I think those are just good lessons to know about. It's just like people want to know. And so if you can approach it from that perspective, it's enrollment is not hard. But the important thing, I think, is share your results so people know what's going on and that they feel empowered by that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alcon. The one other point which I wanted to bring up was just recommendations. And I certainly know you have a lot of good information in the toolkit that we have presented the link to the to those attending. But there were some um, what recommendations for particular families that live in apartments, affordable housing, that really don't have complete control over perhaps pest, mandatory pest spraying that's being done in their buildings. 
Yeah, that's a really difficult one. And what I uh, wrote as a response is what we do know is if you know that there are pesticides being sprayed, the best thing is to close your windows, seal off any gaps to make it is less likely that they would seep through. Um, if you know the day that things are being sprayed, what I, I would recommend is we say the next day to please clean every countertop, vacuum and clean the floors. We know that the children are spending time on um, the floor, but also uh, tabletop surfaces and things where you could be collecting any pesticides on your hands and putting that in your mouth. So the big thing is, is to clean really thoroughly um, and to close your windows so you minimize the amount of pesticides that come in by drift. The other thing that I did mention was pest management professionals um, in California have to be um, educated about integrated pest management. So we say hire a company that will use IPM as their first line and pesticides as a second line. So if you have any opportunity to be a part of that, that's what we recommend. Excellent. Thank you so much for those answers. And I want to thank everyone who's attended. Um, certainly, I didn't see any particular questions for Dr. Sattler, but uh, Dr. Sattler gave us many points for advocacy. Um, she, yeah, many points for advocacy that uh, we can certainly begin locally um, in our area and wherever state you live in or community and really become an advocate for some of the issues we talked about today in the presentations. There is just a few, um, I think thank yous primarily coming up in the chat. And if you wanna put any further questions in there, we'll be on uh, just for a few moments. But again, thank you so much for attending. I wanna thank uh, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments for sponsoring this event. And also to those uh, behind the scenes, Sarah and Hannah who work with Annie to um, have our IT work so flawlessly. So thank you again. Um, hope you all will continue to be advocates and um, will continue to work for improvement of the environment for all children's health. Thank you for joining us.